Okay, good. I'm excited about, uh, I wasn't real excited about uh, Romans as the Bible Bowl. I really still don't know how we're going to, uh, how, I, I, the questions could go anywhere. Oh, look at that. I don't even need my glasses. That's nice. Uh, can you read that, Tony? Can you read that from back there? <laughs> this is good. Jaden, one day you'll understand. <laughs> good. All right. Why'd you put... Okay, there we are. Good. So, uh, we're in Romans chapter 1, and I'm excited uh, because I had, a, I had a class on Romans when I was at Tennessee Bible College, and it was uh, taught by Roy Deaver. And he was right in the middle of finishing his commentary on the book of Romans. Well, it would have been great if we had his commentary in the class because he referred to it. I now have it. He gave me a copy in 95 when, when he finished it. And I'm using uh, his text as, as uh, to help uh, study along this way. And he has, it's such a good commentary. And Whiteside also has a real good commentary on the book of Romans uh, as well, but I'm using Brother Devers. So uh, last week we started Romans chapter 1, and tonight I want to start as a starting point, go back to chapter 1 verse 16, because this is where Paul uh, begins to, to divide or to make application of the things that he started to say in chapter 1. We're all familiar with Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, watch this now, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I want, and I know we know this verse, we memorize this verse, but if we look at this verse as a springboard to the next things that Paul is going to talk about, He's going to talk about the salvation of the Gentiles, beginning in verse 18, and the Jews, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to notice that something that is contrary to, to world popularity and world belief. Paul says in verse 16, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. If the gospel is God's power unto salvation, the two groups of people that he mentions there, are they saved or lost? Were the Jews in need of salvation? Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. They think, well, you know, the Jews were the Jews. They were God's chosen people. And since they were God's chosen people, they didn't really have need of salvation. What happened? Why, did, why were they lost if they were God's chosen people? They were caught up in men's traditions. They didn't keep the law of God. And then the Gentiles. The Gentiles, many people believe or had the, the idea that the Gentiles were unto a law unto themselves and they were not amenable to the gospel of Christ or to the will of God. That's not the case. Paul here begins in verse 18, setting out proof and an argument showing that the Gentiles needed salvation as well as the Jews were in need of salvation. So the point was that there's any, any, under any system of God's will or God's law, all men fell short and they needed the gospel. And the only way to, to, uh, for salvation, <coughs> for them to get out of the wrath of God that we're going to talk about, is through that gospel. So verse 18 is where I want to start tonight. And in this part, verses uh, 18 through verse 23, Paul here is setting forth the argument that the Gentiles are guilty before God. Now, any Gentiles today? We're all, most of us, all of us in this room are, are Gentiles because we're not Jews. Uh, Jews, uh, the Jews were, the Jews and anyone else fell into the realm of the Gentiles. So you can see Paul in his preaching is beginning to talk about why the Gentiles need 
the gospel, why they are amenable to the law of God through the gospel of Christ. And then in verse uh, 18, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So, so the wrath of God, we need to understand a little bit about the wrath of God. Uh, what causes the wrath of God? Or why would, why would God have wrath if he's the creator and the sustainer of the universe? Well, I, what about, though, you know, all the, the verses that talk about God is love and God is, you know, God is compassionate and, and all loving and, and all of those things. How is that consistent and is it consistent with a God being or having wrath? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like we're supposed to discipline our children if we really love them. Same concept. Excellent. Excellent. The wrath of God is the punishment that is dealt that is dealt out by God in reference to disobedience to his will. That's the wrath of God. It's like, okay, as you just pointed out, the wrath, what's the What's the wrath of parents? Do parents have wrath? Just ask any kid that disobeys. You know, Jay and I, you probably never experienced any wrath from your father. For, I know you didn't from your mom. But, uh, but again, the wrath of God. Notice this. God, it's, it's the punishment dealt out by God because of transgressions to his will. He's talking to the Gentiles now. And it has always been thought or thought by many that the wrath, that the, that the will of God or the law of God didn't apply to the Gentiles, but it did. And he's going to show us that it did right here in the next couple of verses. But I want us to talk about, about the wrath of God in the terms of being different from emotional wrath. You know, when, when we think of wrath or being full of wrath as a human, that is stirred up by emotion. You know, I don't, I've, I've been accused on occasion of having a bad temper. Um, and when my temper goes, I'm full flown wrath. But that is different, the wrath of a person that's angry or, or, you know, temper flies off the handle. That's different than God's wrath. Our wrath comes from the seat of our emotion. Our emotions cause us to lash out and to leash out and to be angry and do all those things that, that, that are sinful. The wrath of God, however, is a legal wrath. There is no vengeance in God's wrath. It, it's, it has to do with justice. Part of God being God, part of him being able to be God is he is perfect in his justice. And when we mean, what I mean by he's perfect in his justice is that he has a law. His law is just, it is fair, every part of it. And if you, it, justice demands what? What? Obedience, right? Adherence to whatever the law it, it is. If you, if you have a laws, you know, or rules in your house, you violate those rules, justice implies that's going to be the reaction or the action to your disobedience. There's no, there's no anger involved in that, Jaden. So the wrath of God would be, is it fair to call that a part of God? Absolutely. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, at the end of time, when there's the division between the righteous and the unrighteous in heaven and hell, evil is destroyed and gone forever. Yep. So will there be any more wrath of God? No, there won't so, be. There, there won't because there won't be any disobedience right. to His will. All that's a great point. All those people that are that are going to be divided, the sheep and the goat. The, the sheep are going to enter into to the fold, and they'll always be righteous. There'll never be any more. There'll never be more any more disobedience to the will. But so therefore, there'll be no more wrath. It'll be gone. Not after we get to heaven. No. Okay. We're done. So does that mean that the wrath of God, the part of God, just ceases to exist at that point in time? 
I think it's completed its task, is how I would mention it. Hi, Mike. Hey. Jimmy, go ahead. I, in part, chapter 11, verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity, severity of God. God. Mm -hmm. On them which fail, severity. But towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. That's right. So there, there, there you have it. So, so notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against whom? Or against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Ungodliness is the, is the lack of the proper attitude toward God. If I'm righteous... If I'm living righteously, my attitude is going to be seek God's will. Do what God told me to do to the best of my ability. That's what righteousness is. Living right, living the right way or, you know, uh, following after the righteousness or do, doing that which God would want me to do. Unrighteousness, however, is contrary to that. It's the improper attitude toward God's will. That's where the wrath of God comes in. When we violate or transgress the will of God, justice, the justice of God says there must be punishment for that transgression. Because that's what justice is. God has laid out a law. He's laid out a plan for Jew and Gentile. Now, all are amenable to the gospel after Acts chapter 2. There is no more ignorance. There's no more separate wills or separate laws. We're all under the gospel of Christ. That's the point Paul's making here. Is, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is the, is the lack of proper attitude toward other people or toward living the correct way. Remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verse 12, the golden rule says what? Do unto others is what? you would have them do unto you. That's, the, that's, that's righteousness. You treat people how you want to be treated, treated. You treat people how God wants you to treat them and vice versa. But the wrath of God comes as a result of the actions contrary to righteousness and um, uh, godliness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness those who hinder the truth i think i think hinder is in the american standard it might be in the new king james uh those who hinder or uh suppress what is it suppress suppress, suppress the truth in unrighteousness um hold it down i want you to notice chapter 2 look at verse 23 Paul gives an example of that. Romans 2, look at verse 23. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thou makest thy boast of the law, speaking to the, to the Jews, thou makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? Here's the question. Thou that makest boast of the law. Jew says, okay, I'm under the law of Moses. I'm God's chosen people. I'm a Jew. Okay? Paul says, okay, you're a Jew. You're under the law. Through breaking the law, dis by you disobeying the law, honorest thou God. I got to get back used to, to the King James. Uh, honorest thou God? The answer to that question is what? No. You don't honor God when you disobey his law. Watch this now. Verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Circumcision ver verily profit if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So the idea is <coughs> these, these Gentiles and these Jews were hindering the law of God because they weren't obeying it. They were suppressing it. They were changing it. They, as, as we'll find out a little bit further, uh, Men who hinder the truth in unrighteousness, and unrighteousness is the result of ungodliness. If you're ungodly, if you don't recognize God as God and know that and understand that, you're going to fall into unrighteousness. Can't help it because you don't know any better. 
You'll know, but you won't know, as, we'll, as Paul will get into this in just a minute. Okay, in yes. In Psalms, it says, all thy commandments is righteousness. Everything. So. Yes, so good. It's just them disobeying the commandments of God. Right. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest or brought to light in them, for God has showed it to them. God has shown the Gentiles the difference between what is righteous and what is unrighteous. Well, how did he do that? They didn't have, they didn't have the law. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have a, a written oracles whereby they would know the difference between right and wrong. Oh, yes, they did. Oh, yes, they did. And they were accountable, and Paul's going to tell us how they were accountable. Though man can't know everything about God, we can't know everything about God, can we? But can we know some things about God? Can we know what God expects us to know about God? We must. That's the point. These Gentiles, they knew God, but they didn't, they didn't accept that knowledge. They didn't use that knowledge to benefit them, and it caused them to slip into unrighteousness and therefore receive the recompense of the wrath of God. Verse 19, because that which, watch, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God showed it to them. God showed these Gentiles the difference between what is right and what is wrong. How did he do that? Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Notice that. Looking at the creation of the world, you can rationalize, you can acknowledge certain things about the attributes of God and how you're supposed to live your life. Wait, how can that possibly be? It's how God made us. Think about that. We are made in whose image? God's image. We're not made in man's image. We're made in God's image. What does that entail as it relates to our life? And what we're supposed to do if we're made in the image of God. Are we not to seek after him and seek after his will and determine those things that God has, has set forth for us to know and understand? Exactly. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, how did David know that? He knew that because he looked at himself and he looked at creation and he looked at the rain and he looked at all of the blessings that God has given us through his creation and drew the correct conclusion that there is God behind me. Why don't people do that today? For the same reason the Gentiles didn't do this in the first century. Okay, uh, look real quickly, Acts chapter 14. This is a very good verse scripture. Acts chapter 14. Look at verse 16. Acts 14 verse 16. Uh, yeah. 16. Acts 14. 16. Okay. Who in times past suffered all the nations walked nevertheless. Okay. Uh, go to verse 15, sorry. Uh, it's uh, Acts 14, look at verse 15. And saying, sirs, why do, the, why do you do these things since we are men of like... Now remember when Paul and Barnabas were in... Uh, what were they at? Um, they're in uh, Lystria. And they wanted to... They, they did these miracles and the people wanted to make them gods. And they said that, that uh, Paul was Jupiter... Zeus and uh, uh, Barnabas was uh, they, Barnabas was Jupiter and Paul was Mercury. Okay, and then they said, look, you can't worship us. You can't worship, why? Watch, verse 15. Sirs, why do you do these things? We are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn 
from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all the things therein. Verse 16, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Talking about the Gentiles. At time past, when the Jews had their law, he permitted the nations to walk in their ways. Watch this. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce were staying they to people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. The point that Paul was making here is, look, you, got, you Gentiles, you can't be worshiping us because we're just like you are. You need to worship God who has proven to you that he is God and he is, should be the, the focus of your worship by the things that were made. That's exactly what Paul's saying over here in Romans chapter 1, that, the, the, that God can be clearly seen by the things that are made. Okay, comments? He says that they are, they are without excuse a lot of people today watch verse 20 for the invisible things of god for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse I am responsible as a creation of God in the image of God. It is my responsibility to draw the conclusion that I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that I am not my own boss, that I am not my own creation, that I, that I must serve the living God. I'm without excuse for that. People don't get that. People today, people in the first century, people have always said, I'm my own person. I conduct my own life. Well, God will let you. But in reality, that's not the case. You are without excuse if you don't recognize God. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We are without excuse. Verse 21. Watch, talking about the Gentiles. Because that, when they knew God, notice that point. The Gentiles were without excuse and they knew God. They reasoned correctly that there is a God and I am, and I am to humble myself and be obedient to whatever will he's given me. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. These Gentiles didn't allow the knowledge of God to influence their conduct. How many people in the world today do you think would say they believe in God? What percentage of the United States? 80% believe in God, maybe, maybe less than that now, but a lot. How many of those people that say they, they know God or believe in God allow that knowledge to influence their life to serve God? Far less, far less. That was the case of these Gentiles, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't represent God in the, in the spot that he's supposed to be represented as the creator and the sustainer of the universe, as God. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. What does that have to do with serving God, being thankful? They thought that their success was of their own doing. With their own doing. That's right. And how many times do, do, can we do that? Well, you know, I'm a self-made man. Or everything I've got is because of my hard work. And everything, you know, is because of this or that. No. 
God has allowed me to get this. God has allowed me to, to pursue what I'm pursuing. God has, has blessed me with all these physical blessings and all of the blessings that I've realized. And I'm going to be thankful. And if I'm, if I'm thankful and I recognize being thankful, that's going to help me to be more humble and to me, be more obedient. But when I'm not thankful, you know, like a child, you ever saw a child that's, that's not thankful? Oh, oh, they're, 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 they're like monsters. Uh, not that I would know any like that, but anyway. Because they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Uh, how do you glorify God? John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I glorified thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. That's how Jesus glorified God. He accomplished what he sent him to do. How do we glorify God today? Same way. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say love God, love people. Yeah, good. Yeah, we do the same thing. We accomplish the will that God has sent us to do through Jesus Christ. All right? These Gentiles weren't doing that. They didn't want to do that. They weren't thankful. So therefore, they became vain or empty in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Psalm 19, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart what? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. These Gentiles became foolish and vain in their imagination. Watch this, brethren. When you take God out of the forefront of your life and your decision making and the center of your universe, if you take God away from that, what can you do? anything if you take god's moral code out of your life are you going to live a moral life there's no more morality left it there, exist. there's nothing left everyone does as they see fit in their own life that's that's what it comes down to and that's what it came down to with these gentiles watch it verse 22 profess professing themselves to be wise they became fools Fools. How many people today, atheists, people who claim there is no God, believe in evolution and believe in, in all of these things that are contrary to the truth of God's word, believe that they're not fools? They believe, who do they think the fools really are? Us. We. Us. They think we're the fools. Just like the Gentiles then. And, and remember, in this time in the first century, you had the Greek philosophers. Plato, Aristotle, uh, Aristides, and all of these, all of these Greek and all of these Gentile philosophers trying to discover the meaning of life, trying to look at morality without seeing God, trying to figure out whole, how the whole world looks, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools because they didn't acknowledge God and who he really was. So watch verse 20. getting there for this cause therefore i have i'm sorry uh verse 22 verse 23 and changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creepy things what they do they took god out of first place and put what there idols Idols. How could anybody do that? How could anybody take God out of being the supreme creator and the state of the universe and supplement it with idols? Hmm? People still do it today. Still do it today. Greed, money, everything. Yes, everything. And even even idols. They, you know, like the, the people that believe that God is in that tree. You know, that, that God is, you know, God is in, in my dog or in my cat or 
So, we're, you know, God is in everything. God is everywhere. Well, he is everywhere, but he isn't in, he isn't in a tree. He isn't in things. He's God. And when we start, you know, misplacing God at the center of the universe, at the top of the universe, we do the same thing as these people did. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God to an image made like four-footed beasts and creeping things. Notice verse 24. Wherefore, the conclusion of what these people did leads to the consequences of their action began to be put forth here in verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up. God gave them up to uncleanness. Does God give anybody up? Says he did right here. Free will, right? 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 27. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous, which means complex. Yes. They, God gave them up because they gave up God. God is not going to give anybody up unless they give up on him. Or, yes. I think a good verse on that is in Hebrew chapter 10 and verse 26 where it said if they sin willfully after they receive the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for their sins. In other words God has done all he can do and if they're going to go that far there's no more he can do. And, in, and that's, I think that's where he come to here. Absolutely. He had proved to them and showed them and now there's no more he can do. Nope. And, and so God and what's what's consistent in this, in this terminology in this Greek word is Another translation is God left them unto themselves to follow their own ways. That's what God did by giving them up. You, Isn't that free will? Yeah, well, it's free will, but it's the exercise of free will that you shouldn't be exercising. It is free will, but it's free. God gave, God gave them, look, if you don't want to follow me, go ahead. You're on your own. And he still does that today. If we don't want to choose to to serve God, we might as well just have, have a blast here while we can because the wrath of God is still going to come on those that are unrighteousness, unrighteous and ungodly. Mark, when I look at yes. verses 21 through 23, I noted it's like a six-step plan for falling away, if you will. First off, they didn't glorify God. Then they moved to, they weren't thankful yep. to God. Then they eventually had their mind and their imagination run wild and then their heart was darkened by this type of uh, by this type of mindset and then they thought they were wise and in that they became fools then ultimately they ended up turning to idolatry and then in verse 24 that you're in you see what happens to them at that point god says okay go ahead yeah. you're on your own just like today when people do the people do the same thing when they when god gets out of their mind and out of their life they do whatever they want to do. And God says, okay, I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to make you serve me, but you're going to answer for judgment. Yes, Jay. At what point in this process can we say distinctively today that we know that God will give us up to the lusts of our hearts and impurity? Is it when we exchange the glory of the immortal God for images and idols and we worship other things? Or is it... Just any willful symbol. I, I, think, I think it's when we receive not the love of the truth anymore. When we receive not the love, when we have no more love for the truth, if we don't love the truth, and that's the truth being the whole concept of God and his word and in, in everything that the truth is, when we no longer have a love for the truth, we open the door and God says, okay, go ahead. And that's, that is free will. But, you know, what's going to bring us back, Kitty? God doesn't move, we do. We move, exactly. God will give you up, but he'll only give you up when you give him up first. That's exactly right. Good. Uh, contrast God gave them up with Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good to them that what? Love God and are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. If I love God, and I'm seeking his will, I know that everything that I'm doing is ultimately going to be okay. Now, I might die as a martyr, but what after that? Going to heaven. All things work together for good to them to love God and are called according to purpose. 
called according to his purpose. But what if you don't love God? You're on your own. You're on your own. You don't have God making those things. Now, now sometimes God will, you know, things will happen and try to get you back. But that providentially, we don't know. You know, sometimes that happens and that's happened before. Uh, but we don't know. Verse 24. Wherefore, wait, where, where are we? Uh, verse 25. Who changed, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Today, the truth is turned into a lie when it comes to the word of God. I can live however I want to live. I can sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. I can, I can do whatever I want to do, and I can still be a Christian. Or I can still be godly. You heard that? The Catholic Church now is, is, is up for some types of abortion and all of these things. What? They're changing the truth of God into a lie. But it doesn't work. Go. Verse 26. <clears throat> Uh, for this cause, God gave them up. Here's the second time God gives them up. Gave them up to unrighteousness in the first place. Here, to vile affections. What is that? For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's exactly what it says it's, it was, and it's going on now. Uh in verse 27, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust, sexually oriented, in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is what? Unseemly. How can you look at this verse and think that homosexuality and fornication is okay? And I got a question for you. Which is worse? Fornication. Well, first of all, what's fornication? It's all sexual immorality. All of it. What's worse? Sec, uh, fornication or homosexuality? They're the same. They're the same. Then why is it easier for us as a society and even religious people to accept fornication than it is homosexuality? God doesn't. God doesn't. Okay, well, I did okay. No, you did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. You got a bit farther. Good, good. No, you did good. All right. 